CNA is marking its 25th anniversary this month. And so we're taking the opportunity to look ahead to the next quarter century here in Asia. Yesterday, we looked at the defining role the defense will play. And today's focus is tech. CNA's Chan Yu Im is our lead editor on this project. Things are moving really quickly on the tech front. We're exploring why quantum computing is shaping up as the next frontier of global competition and look at the leading role the U.S. is trying to play. Singapore is also trying to stay on the cutting edge when it comes to artificial intelligence. And the nuts and bolts driving much of this tech development is semiconductors. We'll explore the challenges China faces in an extremely competitive landscape as it moves towards its long-term goal of tech self-sufficiency. Hefei, the capital of Anhui province in East China, an important outpost in China's resistance against the U.S. tech blockade. The state-run Hefei high-tech zone assembles and incubates companies focusing on hotly contested emerging areas, from artificial intelligence to quantum computing and semiconductors. Last year, government-backed investors pumped in $5.4 billion into Hefei-based semiconductor startup Changxin Xinxiao, it's one of the biggest investments from China's flagship semiconductor fund, also known as the Big Fund, in recent years. Russell Liu is the vice president of business development at China Wafer Level CSP. We're more concerned about how we can survive uh, through the process. I mean, it, it is happening, but we don't want to be killed during the process, right? Because the supply chain is going to change. Customer will withdraw from China. Maybe one day we cannot buy you know, this critical material. We don't have access to this tool, or the tool cannot be repaired. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan once used the phrase, a small yard and high fence, to describe the Biden administration's intent to restrict China's access to what he called choke points for foundational technologies. He Weiwen is a senior fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. That will force China to do by ourselves. Self-innovation will make them. And China is the largest semiconductor market of the world, accounting for about one-third. Okay? So if China can do by itself, and the market is still growing, but in that, in that end, the higher leading chip companies of the United States, in the Netherlands, and Japan, and, the country, and the South Korea are excluded, but they will suffer. So this uh, double sword, uh, double-edged sword. But the big state push for tech self-sufficiency proves to be a complex undertaking. In 2022, several executives connected to the big fund were investigated for corruption. Industry observers said for a project of that scale, bumps in the road are expected. There are going to be some misallocation of funds. Right. This is natural because you're trying to use the fund to foster a whole bunch of companies, small companies. Some companies might fail and they will fail. But in the long term, I think the, 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 the funding uh, could still play a critical role. The high stakes game of global tech dominance has gotten countries' attention. TSMC, the world's largest contract chip maker, just opened its first plant in Japan and is planning for a second. Japan said it's ready to give TSMC more than $10 billion for doing that. China will face a steep climb as it works towards its ambition to become a global leader in science and innovation by 2050. Lo Minmin, CNA, Shanghai. The rise of computers in the past century has fundamentally altered the world, creating entirely new systems of communications, commerce, and many other aspects of our daily lives. But the new frontier of quantum computing could prove to be a game changer with potentially seismic tech shifts in the coming decades. This is the architecture we've designed to create modular systems. And research into the quantum realm is taking place here inside IBM's quantum program headquarters just north of New York City. Quantum System 2 was designed to tackle complex problems. Scott Crowder is IBM's vice president for quantum adoption. We do a lot of the activities here from building the underlying quantum processing units uh, to building the systems like the one behind me uh, to building the software stack uh, on top of it. 
Classical computers process information in a binary way with ones and zeros. That limits how much data they can handle and the decisions they can produce. But quantum computing is multidimensional. It processes information in quantum bits or qubits, which very simply delivers better quality results a lot faster. As that power is harnessed, it could help to solve difficult problems facing the world today and lead to breakthroughs in a wide variety of applications from cybersecurity and logistics to drug research. As Jack Hidari, the CEO of the company Sandbox AQ, explains. When it comes to creating new medicine for us, we have to have a better way of creating better treatments, better therapeutics. There are too many diseases such as Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, ALS, MS, that have no great solutions right now for the majority of people. For now, quantum computers require this sort of advanced facility that's out of reach for you and I. But there are signs it's moving from the theoretical realm into the real world. Universities are at the forefront of the U.S.'s quantum strategy. Last year, researchers here at the University of California at Berkeley were able to use a quantum computer to solve a problem that a classical supercomputer couldn't. That was considered an important milestone for quantum computing and the U.S., which many experts believe is currently leading the field. The government has spent around $3 billion to fund quantum efforts as the race heats up between tech firms and between nation states. Experts also consider China a leader in the space. The government has poured around $15 billion into research, going big on quantum communications as it has the potential to make Beijing's data networks difficult to hack. The EU also sees quantum science as critical to Europe's future security architecture. In 2018, it launched its billion-dollar long-term research and innovation initiative, Quantum Flagship. And its member states are building a quantum communications infrastructure set to be ready by 2027. IBM's Scott Crowder believes that the next five years will bring what he calls the first practical uses of quantum computing, followed by a transformational jump at the beginning of the next decade. After that, he says it's harder to predict. These are you know, large systems, probably cloud deployed um, you know, or you know, part of like HPC centers. Um, but when you start talking about a 25-year time horizon, um, it could be more ubiquitous than that. Countries and regions are in a race to be well positioned for the so-called Q-Day when quantum computers will be able to crack codes that protect our digital data. It used to be seen as a date far into the future, but recently some experts said it could come as soon as 2025. Iris Betzer, CNA, Berkeley, California. They may look like ordinary meatballs, but they're derived from the cultivation of microalgae. The firm behind this creation used to rely on manual labor to count and categorize cells by size. Now artificial intelligence does that 30 times faster, with fewer errors and biases. Ricky Lin is the founder and CEO at food tech startup Life3 Biotech. So our productivity has gone up. And in a way, we can now channel our talent and the man hours into other areas that requires a higher value output. The firm also uses AI to optimize the growth conditions of its microalgae. Mr. Lin says this helps reduce costs and hopefully gives them a competitive advantage in expanding overseas. If we want to be a global player, I think what we need to do is to produce at a level that is price competitive as well as consistent quality. Over at this local bank, it's leveraging AI to analyze how much cash its customers are withdrawing at different times of the day. This data is then used to replenish cash at all 600 of its automated teller machines or ATMs nationwide, cutting downtime. Lawrence Goh is the managing director for Group Technology and Operations at UOB. Through this analytical model, we have been able to reduce the trip counts by 25% and ensure 
that our customers continue to get cash at all these ATMs. Back end, the bank also uses the tech to generate presentations and documents like annual reports. It says this has helped improve productivity for 9 in 10 staff and is looking to incorporate more AI solutions in its processes. Here's Lawrence Go again. We are also working with the Monetary Authority of Singapore in working out through some initiatives what are the best use case that could be benefiting financial services. That at least has to conform with being fair, ethical, accountable and transparent. Driving this adoption and setting standards is AI Singapore, an organisation bringing together local research institutions and AI companies. It wants to engage small and medium-sized enterprises to help them train staff and set up the right tech infrastructure to adopt AI. Lawrence Liu is AI Singapore's Director for AI Innovation. We can build you the AI solution, but you need to be able to take over and operate the AI model. So you need to have an IT team, you need to have an AI team. You don't have, we can help train that. Or you can hire our engineers to go and join your organisations. With the government pumping in 1 billion Singapore dollars to boost AI capabilities over the next five years, Mr Liu believes this will boost business confidence for firms in the sector. There will be a lot more companies coming into Singapore to set up their, their, their AI startups or AI shops and so on, right? It will lead to higher employment. Whenever a very innovative startup comes in, when they hire the locals, the locals will learn the technology, learn the tech stack and so on. All these will help triple the number of local AI practitioners to 15,000 and unlock another driver of economic growth for this little red dot. We approached our look at the tech landscape by thinking about some fundamental questions. What are the main trends driving change today and in the next few decades? And will Asia be able to maintain its center of gravity as a semiconductor powerhouse? It's a very competitive global space. Here in Asia, Min Min detailed China's long-term semiconductor ambitions, very much shaped by geopolitical and security issues. Now, Japan is trying very hard to regain its faded chip glory. Its heyday was in the 80s. And as for Taiwan, it's now the global leader in high-value semiconductor manufacturing. And South Korea, of course, currently has a dominant share in memory. Another aspect that we considered was what could next change the world, and it looks to be quantum computing. Advances in this area will also radically transform key areas like AI, which has the potential to be very lucrative. But there are also many barriers to adoption and scaling up, such as cost and ethical concerns. Tomorrow, we'll shift the focus to business and work. Given regional and global challenges, are Asia-Pacific countries poised for resilient growth in the next two decades? And we'll focus on Indonesia, India and Singapore.